Today we are going to be doing a Bible study on meekness and we're going to see the character of God's people in the last days and what He desires for us to achieve through His grace. But first, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, we thank You for giving us the breath of life. We thank you for this day that we can come and worship you in a time of peace. We understand that there are times that are just before us that we will not always have these opportunities. We will not always be able to assemble together in these last days. I pray that we can improve our opportunities to fellowship one with another and to not only keep these truths amongst ourselves, but that we can go forth and share with a world that does not know you. The last message of mercy to a dying world is a revelation of God's character of love, and this is revealed in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. I pray that you'll help us to understand this everlasting gospel, and I pray and that you will allow it to work in us to do of your good pleasure. Please help us to see what it means to be a Christian today. Help us to make decisions for eternity. And I pray that you will lay, that you may humble us in the dust, that we can come to the foot of the cross and see our example in all things. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin our Bible study in Psalms chapter 25. We're going to the book of Psalms. Psalms is is an easy book to find because you can just close your Bible and open right in the middle and most most likely you will find it. Psalms chapter 25 and verse 7. The Bible begins by saying... Are we all there? Amen. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he will teach sinners where? In the way. Is everyone there? Therefore will he teach sinners where? In the way. Do we have our Bibles today? Can everyone lift up their Bibles? Yes, everyone? Okay, praise the Lord. We are going on to verse 9. Psalm chapter 25 and verse 9. you guys mind if I treat you as a Bible class today? Rather than just preaching or sermonizing? Am, uh, is it okay if I ask you questions? Yeah? Okay, then... In verse 9, it, God tells us something very important. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach, where? In his way. So the promise to who he will teach in his way is given to the meek. We want to understand what does the meek mean, and uh, what is this way that God is going to teach us in. And for but before we continue, what does the word meek mean? And anyone's welcome to answer. What does meek mean? Yes? Teachable. Teachable. That is very that is a very good definition of meek. That is correct. Humble. Humble. That is a very familiar definition of meek. What was that? Poor, Poor weak. You see your frailties and you recognize that as Paul said in the flesh it profiteth nothing uh, of me um, there is no good thing so meek is yes it's teachable it's humble it is poor and lowly in spirit we recognize that we do not have everything in ourselves and we are able to be taught and that's why the meek or the teachable will God teach in his way So what is His way in the Bible? 
Let's go to Psalms chapter 67 and verse 2. Psalms chapter 67 verse 2. Psalm 67, 2, the Bible says, That thy way may be known upon the earth, thy, what kind of health? Saving health. Thy saving health among all nations. So, thy way, O God, is connected with his saving health. Does, does our health have to do with our salvation? According to this verse, yes it does. Many people will try and say that my health has nothing to do with my salvation. But God here is saying, the way to God, God's way, who He's going to teach the meek, is His saving health. And He goes even further in Psalm 77. Let's go to Psalm 77. Verse 13, what else is connected with God's way? Psalm 77, 13, the Bible says, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as ours? So the sanctuary of the Old Testament that taught the whole sacrificial systems were prophecies, they were types of Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. God here is saying that the sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. Understanding the sanctuary on earth will help us to understand the sanctuary in heaven. Let's also go, well, we know this. In John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus was identifying himself as the way. Thy saving health is Christ. The sanctuary is Christ. Christ is the way that God wants to teach the meek. And let's also look in Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah 6.16 6, what else does the Bible identify as the way? Jeremiah 6.16 6, I really like this verse because sometimes we come to a fork in our road or in our Christian experience and we're not exactly sure which way should we go? What decision should we make? What should we believe? And Jeremiah 6.16 6, gives us instructions. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the new paths, the new theology, oh, the old paths. Where is the good way? So notice, the good way is the old paths, and walk therein. And if we walk in the good way, which Christ said, I am the way, I am the good shepherd, there is none good but God. Jesus said, He is the good way. Jesus identifies Himself with the old paths, and He says to walk therein, what is the promise to those who walk in the good way? And ye shall find what? Rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. God promises to those who walk in the good way, rest for your souls. This is very interesting because it reminds me of something Jesus said in Matthew 11 and verse 28. Matthew 11:28 Let's go to Matthew 11:28 and we're going to read until verse 30. Here is another promise of Christ that he wants to teach the meek in his way, which is a sanctuary, which is Christ, which is his saving health, which is the old paths. Matthew 11:28 Jesus says, "Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So Christ asks us to learn of him. So who is the teacher here? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So where is it that people generally go to learn and gain knowledge and wisdom? A school. So here, Christ is introducing the school of Christ. Christ is the teacher, we are the students, and He is bidding us to come, take His yoke upon you. And His yoke is ministry. And Christ is saying, learn of me. Why? For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Hey, didn't we just read that? Jesus here is quoting from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. The old past is the school of Christ. The good way is Christ himself. He is a teacher. And in this school, there is a very specific lesson God is trying to teach us. And that is his meekness. It is his lowliness in heart. He desires for us to, by beholding his character of self-sacrificing love, we too can reflect the same humility amongst others. This is a, a blessing. Now when we look at this rest that God is promising to the meek, what is this rest? Isaiah 28 gives us further insight. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 12. This is a familiar passage of scripture, but we're going to focus on verse 12 right now. The old past, the good way, the way that God wants to teach the meek in, this is connected with rest. Isaiah 28 verse 12, Christ tells us what is this rest. Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, or all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is the what? The refreshing, yet they would not hear. Excuse me on that. So another name for this rest is what? Refreshing. Refreshing. Refreshing and rest, they are dealing with the same thing that God is trying to promise to you and I. And But before we look at this refreshing, let's go and continue to investigate this rest that God wants to teach the meek. Exodus 33, verse 13. What is it in God's Word that gives us rest? How does God desire to give us rest? Hold your finger if it's not too late in Isaiah 28. We'll go back there. But Exodus 33, 13. How does God desire to give us rest? Exodus 33, 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy what? Way. way. So what do we need to find to see God's way? Grace. grace. Why? That I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. So God promises he's going to give you rest through grace, but also through his presence, right? God's presence will give us the rest that he promises to the meek and the lowly in heart. What is this presence more specifically? What is a more familiar term we are aware of? Let's go to Psalms 51. We need not guess at anything. Psalms 51 and verse 11. God here is promising us His presence, which is how He gives us rest. Do we want rest in our lives? Yes, we do. Psalms 51 and verse 11. What is God's presence? Cast me not away from Thy presence, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. The presence is the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the presence. The Holy Spirit's presence is the rest that God desires to teach the meek. And the Holy Spirit's also called the Spirit of Grace in Zechariah. But we are actually going to go to Joel. Let's go to the book of Joel to give further insight on this rest. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. And remember, Joel is two books after the book of Daniel. If you can find Daniel, you can find Joel. It goes Daniel, Hosea, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 Notice how God wants to give His presence. Or how does God describe the giving of His presence? Verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. God says He's going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, that verb of pouring out, what is it that you usually pour? What, what state of matter? Liquid. Liquid. Water. Yes, that is correct. So, the Holy Spirit is actually represented by water that God wants to pour upon all flesh. And this is the rest that God is dealing with. And in Joel 2, verse 23... God specifically gives, teaches and introduces this phrase. What is the water which represents the Holy Spirit? Also called, verse 23, Be glad ye, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain, moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. So the Holy Spirit being poured out is called the latter rain. And God's Spirit is how God wants to give the rest. The rest and the refreshing that God is promising to the meek is the latter rain. If we are not meek, we will see in our study that we will not receive the latter rain in the last days. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. We're reading from Joel, but Acts chapter 2 actually quotes Joel, but it words it a little differently. Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. I like how the Bible authors often repeat each other and one may word it slightly different and it actually sheds more light on the passage that we're trying to understand. When does this latter rain or when does this rest take place that God is promising to the meek? Peter goes into more detail in verse 16, Acts 2.16, But this is that which, the, which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the beginning of the world. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So the latter rain is actually a prophecy of the last days in a final outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And with the, the Spirit comes the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance. Meekness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Part of the latter rain is God developing in us a character that is ready for His soon return. Now, in Isaiah 28, we read that there was another term for this rest. This rest is also called the refreshing. Thank you. Now, the word refreshing is also very interesting. We're still in Acts, but how many times does the Bible use the word refreshing in the entire Bible? 
It's only twice. There's only two witnesses in all the Bible that uses the word refreshing. Does someone know where the second witness is? Acts 3.19. Thank you. Acts chapter 3.19. It's fun studying with Bible students. Acts 3.19. During the time of refreshing, what does God desire for us to do? Therefore, when we see the latter rain in the last days, what should we be doing? Repent ye therefore, and be what? Converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Remember, the presence of the Lord is the rest. It is the refreshing. It is the Holy Spirit being outpoured. This is the times of refreshing, the latter rain that is promised to the meek. And during this time of the latter rain, we are to be repenting. God wants to convert us and have our sins being blotted out. Let's look. Let's also go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. First Corinthians chapter three, verse one. There are actually conditions upon receiving the latter rain. Many people think that the latter rain will just come on us however we please. We can live as we want today, and when it's time for the latter rain to be poured out, we will be recipients just because we profess to believe in the true faith. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul is speaking and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So to be a babe in Christ is to be carnally minded. Hear this verse, we see they are synonymous terms. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So the church of Corinth, who he's speaking to right now, are they a repentant, converted, having their sins blotted out type of state? No, they're not. They are unconverted. They are not repentant for their sins. Therefore, they have not been blotted out. And the church of Corinth, in this current condition, would they be recipients of the latter rain if things don't change? So we need to ask ourselves, are we exemplifying similar characteristics to the church of Corinth? Because if we are, we are not prepared to receive the latter rain. Verse 3 gives us some insight. We can reflect upon ourselves. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there are among you envyings and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? There's arguing. There's envying. There is strife and divisions. Everyone's going to their separate ways. The unity that Christ prayed for does not exist. And... This is, the care, this is the state that we see God's people many times, and even now today. This is not a converted state of being. This is the unconverted. This is babes in Christ. Though we may have understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and though I have the gift of prophecy and have not charity, I am nothing. And this is what we see. Verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watereth, but God giveth the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God 
giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. When we are trying to choose sides, I'm with a Paul and I'm with Apollos. I don't want to listen to that person because I was baptized in the name of Paul, uh, then this is the unconverted, this is carnal, this is what babes in Christ do. And this is not who God is promising to receive the latter rain. But I am very thankful that Brother Salvador had been able to share about this new heart experience because this is what we're going to see in Ezekiel 36. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. The latter rain is also described as described in Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Ezekiel 36, 25, the Bible gives us a promise. God says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So the sprinkling, this is dealing with the sprinkling of the latter rain. This is clean water God is pouring upon all flesh which we'll see what does it mean when God pour, he sprinkles his latter rain verse 26 a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you I will take away the what kind of heart? the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirits within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them so the sprinkling of clean water is also again represented by God putting his spirit within you another proof text to prove that the latter rain is the outpouring of God's spirit but during the time of the latter rain, he's trying to take away our stony hearts. Now, dealing with a stony heart, did not Jesus say a parable of people with stony hearts? A sower went forth to sow. Some fell, some of the seeds fell by the wayside. Some fell upon stony places. Some upon thorns. Others fell into the good ground, right? We're familiar with it. The stony ground hearers, they had not uh, depthness of roots. And when the sun of persecution arrives, they withered away. They were offended. They did not last through the persecution. We're going to look at the stony ground hearers. To look more into this, these are those who did not allow God to give us a new heart. To have a renewal of a new spirit, not one of self and self-sufficiency, of pride and boasting, it was one of Christ's meek and lowliness of heart. I would like to read you a very powerful quote in Christ's Object Lessons 411, COL 411. We read, The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They advocate the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. Did you catch that? The stony ground hearers are the foolish virgins. The same class of people, just different parables. It's also another repeat and enlargement upon the same condition of God's church. So when we read the stony ground hearers, the sower went forth to sow, we are reading the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They receive the word with readiness, of readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. 
the Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him a new nature. We need to consent to allow God to implant in us a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied His character. The foolish virgins don't know God and they haven't studied His character. Have you studied the character of God? You will see when Christ says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. He is saying, Study my character. I'm meek. I'm lowly. I'm humble. Learn of me and reflect the meekness of Christ. The foolish virgins are not meek. The foolish virgins are not humble or teachable. Yet they love the truth. They advocate the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. And they're not hypocrites. But they have a stony heart. And they haven't allowed God to give them a new heart. And this is what God desires to give. You know what separates a wise from a foolish? One of many things. Let's find out in Proverbs 9, 8. One thing that separates a wise man from a foolish man, or a wise virgin from a foolish virgin, we have insight in Proverbs 9, verse 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a what man? A wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So we see one thing that separates the wise from the foolish is how they receive reproving. Are you going to be meek when you are buffeted for your faults? Or how much more when you are buffeted and you didn't do anything wrong? How will you reflect the character of God in that moment? Reproving is one thing that separates the wise and the foolish. The wise man receives it. But let's go to Proverbs 15, verse 10. Just a few chapters over. Proverbs 15, verse 10. Who is it that hates reproving, that does not like correction? In verse 10, the Bible says... Correction is grievous unto him that has forsaken the what? The way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. Now think about, apply this to ourselves. When I am corrected, do I find this to be very grievous? Do do self rise up and I want to defend myself? Or am I going to, like Christ, be as a lamb that was brought to the slaughter, and as a sheep to the shearer is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth? Am I quick to defend self and to justify my actions? Or am I willing to listen and to hear the reproof, the faithful rebukes of a friend who simply cares for our life, for my life and desires to see me succeed in this Christian experience. Correction is grievous to those who have forsaken the way. And the way we saw is the sanctuary. The way is thy saving health. If our health is not very well, are we going to find correction grievous? Yes, we will. And Christ is also the way. If we have forsaken Christ, our husband, Correction will be grievous. Let's also go to Psalms chapter 104. Sorry, 141. 
Psalms chapter 141, verse 5. Psalms 141 and verse 5. We're looking at reproving and correction. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be kindness. <clears throat> Let him reprove me, it shall be in what? Excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. So here we see that another thing represented by the reproving of a righteous man is excellent oil. Oil is symbolized by reproving. What, what also does oil represent in the scriptures? Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let's see a proof text for this. In 1 Samuel 16, and verse 13 the Bible says then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah so here we see yes you are correct oil was represented by the Spirit of the Lord or the Holy Spirit and also oil is represented <coughs> by reproving the Spirit of the Lord when God gives his presence he gives us rest this rest is the refreshing the from the presence of the Lord this is the latter rain the outpouring of God's Spirit is the latter rain represented by oil do we see this <coughs> So, oil is also represented by reproving. Who here wants to receive the latter rain? Yes. Who here wants to be reproved? <laughs> That's a hard one. Uh, praise the Lord. It is through reproving that the latter rain comes. When we read the Word of God, we see how we have forsaken the way as a wise man by God's grace we will become wiser and and correct uh, the rod of correction will help us to get back on the path to get back our saving health to get back the way of God which is in the sanctuary and find and be led to the foot of the cross Jesus who is the way the truth and the life but it takes humility to be corrected. Let's also go to Second Chronicles seven thirteen. Second Chronicles seven thirteen. The Bible gives us yet another another condition upon receiving the latter rain. Second Chronicles 7.13 The Bible says, If I shut up heaven, that there be no what? Rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. If. You see that word, if? If is a very powerful two-letter word. It shows us the condition upon receiving the rain. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and do what? Pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Then and only then does the promise can we claim the promise that God's going to listen to our prayers, He'll forgive our sins, and He'll heal our lands. We need to humble ourselves and pray. Is it humiliating to pray sometimes? 
is it humiliating through prayer we recognize that we can't do this not by my might nor by my strength but by by your spirit saith the Lord of hosts it's through only by God's grace it's only through his strength that we can accomplish that which we are unable to do and through prayer we are able to reach forth and to ask for help is asking for help humiliating to some it is it can be challenging but this is one of the conditions upon receiving the latter rain is humility and humbling ourselves the Bible says it's humiliating to prayer to pray in this verse so let's go to Mark chapter 11 when we pray what specifically should we pray for and as we seek for forgiveness what should we do what is also one of the conditions upon being forgiven from our Father which is in heaven do we all want to be forgiven of our sins yes we do but there is conditions upon forgiveness let's go to Mark 11:25. Jesus is speaking and says and when ye stand praying do what? forgive, forgive. if ye have aught against any that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses but if ye do not forgive neither will your father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses when people have wronged us or if we have ought against any anyone then God says before you pray for you know, before you ask me for forgiveness you need to forgive them because that bitterness towards someone else is like drinking poison hoping the other person would die and it's not going to help you and God says you need to release that to me allow me to deal with this and in order for God to forgive us we need to forgive others it's very clear and simple it's simple but it's not easy now did Christ follow his own counsel yes he did Let's go over to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23:33. Luke 23 verse 33. This is our example in all things, is he not? So when we what we are about to read is what God desires to work in each of us. We should not distance ourselves from the words of God, but we shall we should eat them and assimilate it and allow it to take part in every portion of our body. Luke twenty three thirty three and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do and they parted his raiment and cast lots even as Christ was dying on the cross he was asking he was praying for his enemies that God would forgive them he was pleading for their salvation while they are crucifying him while he is being persecuted sinless though he was he had every right to call angels down from heaven to protect him even to wipe them away he did nothing but he he lied on the cross and there died for their sins let's go to Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 and let's read verse 44 Jesus again is teaching us these are some hard sayings Matthew 5:44 but I say unto you love your friends love your enemies bless them that curse you 
Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What does that word despitefully mean? Or despite? What is that? With hatred. Are they using you on purpose? On purpose. Do they know what they're doing to you? They're doing it out of spite or in spite of you. And you can usually see it when people are persecuting you and using you through spite. These are the people that we want to say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. No, thank you. Or we'll want to revile back. You hit me, I'll hit you. Just throw the first punch. Come on. I want to hit you. And this is the type of mentality that we oftentimes uh, reflect in when our characters clash with one another. But Christ says we, we should pray for our enemies. When people cut us off in traffic, that's when God says, pray. And one thing, this could be very difficult in the moment, but one thing that praying for your enemies does is it does more for you who pray than it does for your enemies. How? Because through praying for those who have despitefully used you, that basically create, it changes your heart. And it also allows the Holy Spirit to work in their life for their salvation to change their hearts. But it allows you to, it opens you to the Holy Spirit to change the way you look for that person by praying for them and thinking the thoughts of Christ towards them, thoughts of peace and not of evil, then it allows you to actually care for them. And when you truly love your enemy or you truly love the person who's despitefully using you, then you're not going to want to attack him back. Charity suffereth long and is kind. And so prayer praying for your enemies is actually a remedy that God is giving to us for depression. The cure for depression. The cure for anger or a temper problem. God says, pray for those who despitefully use you. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. That is true. So let's, all, let's drop our eyes down to verse 39. Matthew 5, verse 39, Jesus says, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him to the other. Turn him the other also. Remember, this is again the tit for tat. When one strikes at us, we want to strike back. But Christ is saying, you know, take it patiently. And... <clears throat> When we look at Christ as our example, what did Christ do when his persecutors smote him on the cheek, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote you? And they're smacking him, they're piercing, uh, they are putting the nails, the, the crown of thorns upon his head, they are beating him and whipping him, they're making fun of him and blaspheming. When they smote him on the cheek, Christ not only turned the other cheek, how did Christ respond to that? He could have brought allegiance from heaven and wiped them out, but Christ responded to this mistreatment by going to the cross and dying for their sins. Christ took this and sacrificed himself out of love. This is self-sacrificing love. This is our example in all things. Now, this is oftentimes when people start saying, well, I'm not there yet. I can't do that. That's, that's not where I am right now. And we want to distance ourselves from Christ and saying, well, that's Jesus, but I'm me, and that's not where I am. But I want to share with you a promise. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us a very encouraging promise when it comes to the character of Christ, when it comes to 
following our example in all things, even the death of the cross. 2 Corinthians 12.9 The Bible says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. What does the word sufficient mean? Enough? Enough? Adequate? So Jesus is saying that my grace is enough for you. My grace is adequate for you. When you say, I cannot, God says, my grace can. It is enough for thee. You say, but I'm weak, Lord, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When we are weak, that's when Christ's strength is the most powerful. The grace of God has the power to overcome sin, to overcome self, and to give us a humble heart and a self-sacrificing love for those, even our enemies. The grace of Christ is called here the power of Christ that may rest upon me. There's the Spirit, the presence of God that is able to give us rest. When we have the power of Christ, we have the grace of Christ. The grace is given to the meek. For God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. That's James 4, 6. So, and again, even still people may say, but Jesus is God, but I cannot do that. But this is so hard. And we have all these reasons, but this or but that, that we do not need to obey the words of Christ. And I want to ask you a question. You know what the difference is between a sheep and a goat? So their horns, right? So the difference between a sheep and a goat is a horn is their horns, and the goats with those horns, what do they do? They butt. But this, but that, but this. Every excuse why not to follow the words of God. When God says, Bless them that curse that curse you and do good to them that despitefully use you, but that's a goat. And God is saying Goats be on the left side when I come. The sheep are on the right side. And, the go- and God is making a separation between the wise and the foolish. God wants us to be humble. And, hum- and charity suffereth long. It suffers for God's sake. But this is the cross of a Christian. This is what Christ is asking us to do for His sake. Let's go to uh, Proverbs 25, verse 14. And we're closing here. We're closing very soon. We're wrapping up. You know what is going to debar many from receiving the latter rain? One thing that will that many will miss out on receiving this blessing, this gift of the latter rain. Proverbs 25.14 lets us know, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without what? Rain. So here we have someone who is boasting himself, he is likened to a cloud without rain, without the latter rain. And what does boasting mean? Pride, proudful. This is the opposite of the meek and lowly character of Christ, right? God who giveth grace to the humble, he resists the proud. God here is saying that 
being boastful and being proudful and self-sufficient is going to prevent many of us from receiving the latter rain. This is not what God's will is for us. Now, humility is not an option. The proud will not inherit the earth. It is the meek that will inherit the earth. If Christ did not believe by His grace, which is sufficient for thee, that you can be humbled, then He would not have died for your sins. Do you realize this? That if Christ saw no hope for your soul, He would have never gone to the cross. And He would have never led you in an example. The fact that Christ died for your sins and endured such hatred and persecution shows there is hope for you. You are not lost today. And we serve a loving Savior that is able to lift you up and lead you step by step to teach you of His meek and loneliness of heart in the school of Christ. Let's look at a few more verses and we'll close. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23. We saw that the power of Christ is called grace, which is sufficient for us. That is the power of Christ. But what else is the power of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. But we preach Christ, what? <clears throat> Crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified is the power of God. It is the grace that is going to help us to overcome our character defects. Let's go to Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, we're looking at what is this power. The power is grace. Grace is not just a cheap grace that God gives to clothe your sin, that you may remain sinning and He accepts you. That is not the definition of grace. Grace is His strength, which is made perfect in weakness. Grace is the power to overcome sin. It is Christ and Him crucified. We're going to Romans 1.16. What else is the power of God in Romans 1.16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, it, there in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written in Habakkuk chapter 2, the just shall live by faith. So the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. And in the gospel we see the righteousness of God revealed. The righteousness or the character of God also includes the meekness, the humility of God. His willingness, His self-sacrificing love for us. This is revealed in the gospel. The self-sacrificing love is the power of God. And let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. We have a prophecy in the last days what would be the condition of God's church. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the which days? In the last days, perilous times shall come. Now drop down to verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. God says that His people would have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Did you know many people deny the power thereof in our lives? And we want to distance ourselves from verses like this that are correction and rebuke and reproving and say, this doesn't apply to me. Um, yeah, those people, they look like Christians, but they deny God. 
When you understand that the power of Christ is His grace to overcome sin, then you'll understand that to deny the power when we say, but, that's Christ, but, He's God, but, I cannot do what He did. That's denying the power thereof. When we say, I cannot overcome sin, you just denied the power of God with a form of godliness. Christ said, from such, turn away. One more verse and we can close. This power, this latter rain that we are looking forward to, or that we desire to receive in Revelation 18.1. Let's read Revelation 18 and verse 1. <coughs> We know what angels are, right? What is an angel? Messenger. It's a messenger. So what is what word is found right there in the word evangelist? Angel. Angel. Evangelist. So does God want all of us to to do the work of an evangelist or to give the to be messengers of his everlasting gospel? Yes, he does. These three angels' messages, the everlasting gospel, these are not just heavenly beings that are flying in the midst of heaven. God has not trusted to heavenly angels the work of sharing the gospel to a world that doesn't know him. God entrusted this work to you. He will not work without human instrumentality, with cooperation with Him. So when we read this angel, recognize that God is speaking of you. He desires to fulfill this verse through you co-laboring with God. Revelation 18 and verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great what? Power and the earth was lightened with his glory or his character, with the meekness and humility of God. This angel, among like Christ, this angel represents you. God wants to use you to have great power, this message of his grace, the message of Christ and him crucified, the message of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God. The power um, here that lightens the whole earth with His glory, this is also known as the latter rain. This is the work of the latter rain, and we see that there are conditions upon receiving the latter rain. One of them is we need to humble ourselves. We need to learn of the meek and lowliness of Christ. And when we are tempted to say that we cannot overcome Remember the promise, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And if we want to be made perfect by Christ's strength, and we are feeling our weakness, then brothers and sisters, we have a divine Savior, and we have the promise of God that uh, He can change our hearts. So is this our desire today to reflect the meek and lowly character of Christ? If this is, I would like to invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of Christ. We thank you for your gift in giving us your only begotten Son. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. We desire to lighten the whole earth with your glory, with the life of God. We desire to learn uh, in the school of Christ, having Christ to be our teacher. We desire to learn of the meek and lowliness of Christ. And we recognize that as we ask for you to change our character, you will put us in positions that we will be tried. You will give us opportunity to be persecuted, 
to see if we truly do desire to change our character through these trials and adversities. The psalmist said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. I pray that in the afflictions of our everyday life, we may not forget you and your character, that especially in the trial and temptation, we can remember the words of Christ, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Please help us, help save ourselves from ourselves. We desire to be like thee. In Jesus' name, amen.